remaining hour that we have. <laughs> Just, um, it's my uh, great pleasure for all of you who are here and who will be listening to, to this uh, at the later stage, um, because of course, owing to the um, conditions at the universities now, um, many people will not be able to, to access this from their offices. Um, I, I would like to welcome uh, David, David Luther, for this um, um, very interesting uh, talk, which is taking us actually into the present, which is um, a little bit different from um, many of the other historical uh, um, topics. But the important thing is that um, this is a living project, and um, the um, what we can learn out of this is applicable also to other projects. And Romina, you, you will later probably be saying something about yours as well. Um, it, it, to the person of David Sauter, uh, he's also quite untypical because he's actually he comes from a completely different background. So not a trained theologian as, I, as far as I know. And um, so, uh, you know, he has a, a, um, a background in the sciences in the, uh, technology. So it's a, a, a real um, life, real world person, um, and um, uh, yet he's got um, a very deep insight into both the ancient culture and the um, uh, the contemporary setting in which uh, Muslims and Christians and uh, a few remaining Jews also um, live side by side. Um, so without wanting to say much more, I would like to pass the word to, to David. And um, uh, this is being recorded, so um, everything that you say can be held against you. So it's the, yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Lars. Uh, it, it's very kind of you to give me this opportunity, especially in such difficult circumstances. So uh, I feel uh, greatly honoured to be able to give a talk at SOAS. Um, as you mentioned, I have interests that are uh, fairly broad, and I hope what I say will be of interest to everyone able to take part now. And perhaps, um, I, I believe you're recording this, as you say, then there will be others in the future who could perhaps find something interesting as well. Um, I'm going to attempt to share a screen and run us through a series of slides. Uh, which ought in theory to take about 45 minutes. Um, I, I will control the timing of each slide um, so I can speed up or slow down if we're a little bit uh, you know, over, over the, the intended um, time. Um, but I believe we have an, an, until at least two o'clock, uh, possibly a little bit later. So hopefully, um, given that I've slimmed down the various slides, there shouldn't be a problem. So bear with me, please, because um, not only are there uh, potential problems with the, the internet connection and Zoom, but I'm, I'm not hugely experienced in, in dealing with this sort of uh, screen sharing technology. So forgive me if, if, we need a, if, if we need a couple of goes, but I'll, I will begin and um, fingers crossed. Here we go. So um, I need to get rid of this. Can you just get rid of that? Okay. Um, I hope you're able to see that adequately. Is that okay? Can anyone hear? I hope anyone. Yes, we can, yes, yes, can see can. Okay. it. That's Large great. Screen. Yes, thank that's you. very reassuring. Thank you. <laughs> right. So that that's that's the title, as everyone I guess knew well. Um, I put up an abstract here, which I hope many people will have had a chance to see beforehand. But this is a, a brief overview. Um, the focus of the talk really is, I hope, that it's going to be an encouragement to people to have a go. Um, resources are always limited, as we as we know, um, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't make a beginning, even if you have to use your own money, which is what I've been doing. Uh, <laughs> you can do something. So um, I think there's something that can be done, even with limited resources, can be encouraging to people um, and can achieve synergy. 
But what I'm going to do is run through uh, a bit of the background as to how I became involved with this, uh, and then uh, go into some uh, particular examples, which, as, as Lars kindly said, are still developing. So, um, yeah, I've still got stuff at the top of the screen here, but I hope you can see what I'm sharing. Um, Egypt uh, is, is dear to my heart, and not least because it has a very, very long cultural history, um, going back at least 7,000 years. Uh, if, if you care to, you can make that a good deal longer still. Uh, but it's a history that's, that's been fascinating to me ever since I was a boy, really. Um, and um, it made me want to study ancient history at university, um, but my Latin was not good enough, um, and I, en I ended up as a scientist. So <laughs> but I've been um, studying Egyptology uh, and Egypt in all its forms for many, many years. So amongst the things I did was to teach myself hieroglyphs, and I translated the texts on a late period coffin in Ply Plymouth City Museum, which had been there for 90 years. Um, and so I was able to find out uh, who this person was. He was a, a, a wab priest, so sort of cleansing priest. Um, and um, I found out his parents and all sorts of other things. Um, and the translation was checked by a proper Egyptologist and then published by the museum. So I only mention that just to give a bit of street cred to my claims to, to know and love Egypt. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I've got a strange background, as you may have seen from the speaker bio. Besides being a scientist, I've got a degree in moral philosophy, and um, I've dabbled quite a lot in anthropology. So I'd like to think I have a background in cultural history as well as pure sciences. And of course, as so many others have, I just went to Egypt initially as a tourist uh, and found you know, many, many things of interest because I was able to, to see uh, hieroglyphs in situ. But I came back. Now, um, one of the key things I believe is that in ancient times, Egypt was known as the two lands, Tawi, uh, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. If, if you may be able to see my cursor, uh, this is, is Lower Egypt, the Delta region, and Upper Egypt, because uh, we're looking south here. This is the way the ancient Egyptians looked at things from the Great Green, as they called it, the sea here, the Mediterranean, back up into the Nile Valley. So this is the Fayum, if, if people know Egypt, and Cairo is around about here. But there are still two lands. There are still rich people and poor people, Muslims and Christians, employed and unemployed. And what you see if you're a tourist and what you see if you're not a tourist. So what I'd like to do is try to show um, what's going on insofar as I've been able to see it in what I call the real Egypt. Uh, while I've been doing voluntary work uh, with various communities um, in Egypt, different places across Egypt, in fact, since 2013. And I believe, maybe not my place to say, but I believe um, these links can be inspirational. I've certainly found them inspiring. Um, and I, I know at least a number of Egyptians who are very happy with them as well. But the point um, of these particular partnerships is that they were set up with a view to being a two-way partnership, genuinely two-way, because I think each of the two sides of the partnership can inspire and assist in significant ways the other side of the partnership. So just a bit of background here. Uh, forgive me that I'm going to be delving into some unpleasantnesses, um, but those form a necessary introduction, I think, because they're the background to how all this developed. So Egypt was a Christian country for hundreds of years until the Islamic conquest in the seventh century AD, uh, 21 AH there, I've, I've put, that's roughly the, the, the date. Um, and after that time, both faith communities more or less were able to live together peacefully. But in the 20th century, particularly, there was a great um, change in economic conditions. Um, 
rapid population growth, extra economic stresses, uh, the change in the flooding of the Nile and, and many other things, uh, all of which led to interfaith tensions. Uh, interfaith discrimination is against Egyptian law. Um, and everyone, I hope, would wish that, that any prejudice should be overcome and peace should be restored. Um, sadly, it hasn't always been possible to maintain peace, and I'd like to show you a few of the difficulties. Uh, we will move on to some more positive things soon. So in 2013, there were media reports of civil unrest, interfaith violence all across Egypt. Some uh, people watching this seminar today might remember that. Um, huge street protests, and um, there were sit-ins uh, to, to protest at the departure of President Morsi. Um, and one of the main sit-ins was at uh, Raba al adawiyah Mosque in Cairo. And the protesters refused to leave, and the army were adamant that they had to leave, and forcibly dispersed them, and many hundreds of people were killed, which clearly is very, very bad. Um, that created huge, huge upheaval, and some of the people who are maybe amongst the more extreme elements of those pro Morsi supporters encourage revenge attacks, not against the army, because um, it's pretty difficult to attack the army, frankly. Um, so they attacked Christians who, for some reason, were viewed as being supporters of the army, and they were certainly very much easier targets. Now, Christians, uh, Christians themselves say that they form nearly 20% of the population in Egypt, far, far more than the official figure used by the media, which is normally about 10%. Um, very, very rare for any medium to to admit to there being more than 10%, but it's a sizable majority, sizable minority, I should say, uh, whatever figures actually used. And the overwhelming uh, majority of the Christian population are Coptic Orthodox. Um, and that church was founded, they say, by St. Mark in about 43 AD. And I find them very interesting because they faithfully preserved uh, what is still possible to preserve of ancient Egyptian culture, in particular, uh, large chunks of, of the language, the, the last stages of ancient Egyptian, and indeed music, which I haven't mentioned on this slide. Um, so it, it's a fascinating uh, preservation of an ancient culture, I think, uh, mixed in with some Koine Greek for, the, for uh, the, the, the current Coptic language. Now in in 2013, um, because of these, what I'm calling revenge attacks, that may be an unfair description, but certainly this huge civil unrest, um, the cops really suffered very badly. Um, I, I've mentioned those in uh, Rabba al adawiyah Mosque, they obviously suffered very badly too. Um, but in terms of the Christian damage, uh, I've listed here all sorts of um, figures outlining the damage that was done. It was significant. It was reported uh, to some extent in the media in the West. I mean, Al Jazeera, France 24, a few other channels uh, gave more coverage to it than BBC and other sort of uh, TV stations did, but, but it was pretty bad. Um, and the attacks did not end simply on the 14th of August. They carried on for weeks. So um, I haven't gone into the detail here, but in my background, um, I've got quite some experience of burnt out churches and religious buildings, uh, both in Britain and in Germany, because uh, I've lived in both places. And I felt for these poor folk who'd had their, their places of worship destroyed. And I thought, was there anything we could do? And it occurred to me that in England, at least, we tend to have quite a lot of material assets uh, and not, in my experience, very much community spirit. Whereas insofar as I've become able to find out about uh, people in Egypt, they do seem to me to have a lot of community spirit, even if they're pretty poor, um, as many are, sadly. So I thought we could bring the two sides together <clears throat> in a 
synergistic partnership uh, and it would help everybody. That's including us here as well. <laughs> um, so I decided to collect some gifts and instead of sort of putting them in an envelope and sending them off to somebody in what I call a big class tower, um, I was advised and, and it seemed to me sensible um, to buy myself a flight to Egypt and, and just find out on the ground where the need was greatest. Um, and so I took leave of uh, my family, wife, three children and the day job, um, even though it was a bit, it was, it was quite considerably dangerous in fact at the time and foreigners were advised not to travel. So the first stop was St. Mark's Cathedral in Cairo, um, the equivalent of St. Peter's at, at the Vatican in Rome. And I had to get through two tanks and three sets of steel gates. And frankly, despite all that security, uh, three years later, there was a, a, a terror attack inside that compound, which killed many, many people. So despite all that security, it wasn't secure. This is where uh, the head of the Coptic Church, His Holiness Pope Tawadros, uh, was living at the time. Um, he now has another place to live in as well. Uh, but I waited here for six hours um, until one of the papal officials um, came up to me and said, you know, who are you, chum, basically? <laughs> Strange foreign person. Um, but it was kind of them. And, and I was really, really grateful that they, they took notice of me and listened. And I guess partly because it was so unusual um, for a foreigner to be doing this, uh, I was invited to meet His Holiness um, himself that very evening um, in a private audience. So here I am uh, with His Holiness uh, in October of 2013. And um, he's very welcoming and we had a good um, opportunity, I had a good opportunity to outline to him what I was proposing, and he very kindly uh, said he would certainly help. Um, as I've said in this slide here, I wanted it to be not one-way charity, uh, which, you know, often has been perhaps the case for Europeans dealing with people who are, are in other countries, um, but a genuine two-way partnership. And I'm sure His Holiness was able to to see that, that I genuinely was interested in Egypt and wanted to help if I possibly could. And he said that we were the, that, that I was in a sense, you know, the first representation to suggest this sort of approach, which um, frankly surprises me, but then, you know, maybe I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't contradict what he was saying. Anyway, he said his bishops would help me to visit areas of greatest need. Um, so, uh, there I am having a handshake, um, because I'm not, I'm not a, a Coptic Christian or an Orthodox Christian, you know, I'm not used to kissing hands or anything, so we just had a handshake. Anyway, over the next two weeks, I travelled to very dangerous places, not just in Cairo, but all across Egypt, basically. Um, some of the worst areas, Minya, uh, Sohag, or Sohaj, um, Delga, Western Desert, and, and I was able to talk to people um, who were banned to diplomats and clergy and even journalists um, because of the difficulty of the circumstances. Even the Middle East correspondent for the BBC, who was then Orla Geri, who, as you probably will have seen, you know, visits all sorts of dangerous places uh, for her reports. Uh, was not allowed to visit the places I did. So it was a, it was a great privilege, frankly, um, all made possible by Pope de Wydros. This is just a little joke slide I put in when I give talks just to show people there are many things to see in Egypt, um, which we don't see in England or anywhere in Europe, frankly. These are camels going off to probably an unpleasant fate. <laughs> sadly for them. Um, and again, you know, with our cities here, we're used to probably more splendid conditions than can be found even in some of the better streets in Alexandria. This is 
Egypt's second city. And uh, people collect their groceries in baskets, drop down on ropes. Uh, not always, but they do sometimes. So this is just an idea of, of a, a typical street in, in a sizable Egyptian city. Um, amongst other places, I heard this, I, I went to Sohag, uh, which is a city of about a quarter of a million <clears throat> in sort of what you might call Middle Egypt, which is strictly part of Upper Egypt, um, on the way down towards Luxor. And Bishop Bachom, um, was attacked in his own cathedral by terrorists who'd broken in uh, using heavy butane gas cylinders to batter down the door. And then they threw in these cylinders and of course they explode like giant grenades. Um, I got a film of this attack actually, which the bishop gave me. I haven't really included that in this presentation, but <clears throat> it, it's fairly frightening. And he is a very brave man. He, he challenged these people and um, live to tell the tale. Here's some of the defacements on the wall. Pretty unpleasant and disrespectful, but then I guess, you know, if you're willing to break into a place of worship and set fire to it, a few graffiti don't seem to matter. Um, this is a burnt out interior. I crunched around on, you know, all sorts of stuff to take that picture places outside. You get the idea. This is Father Tima Sawis, who, who, who's sort of having to carry on his pastoral work while there was a, um, a literacy class going on in, in, in what was usable of that building. Here's another building um, in Minya, uh, again, Middle Egypt, another city of about a quarter of a million. Big university there, incidentally. Um, very badly damaged. And this is Abuna Victor, Father Victor, uh, who I will always remember insisted on making me a cup of tea. I mean, you know, almost made me weep. But so, so welcoming and so friendly and so keen that, that people should know about the difficulties, not because they're condemning anyone, but but just to say, look, you know, we are carrying on. This this will not stop. Uh, what we do is on the roof. You can see some of the damage. And in the worst and most difficult areas, I wasn't always protected by anybody at all, frankly. But in the worst areas, I had a, a convoy of seven police vehicles and 30 armed guards uh, just for me. So I felt like, you know, the visiting president of a, of a foreign state or something, because it was this huge convoy. Uh, and in the worst place, uh, Delga, uh, or Delgia in the local dialect, um, the army had needed three weeks to recapture this village, basically, from a mob of 3,000 extremists. And there was still an, an armoured personnel carrier and a tank uh, there when we left. So here's here a couple of the people guarding me, some of the police uh, jeep things. Um, here's some of the senior officers. The man on my left uh, uh, is, is, a, is a police general. Um, I think he was surprised to find a foreigner there. <laughs> and he said, you know, do you like Egypt? Do you think it's beautiful still? So I said, um, you know, it is, yes, despite the difficulties. Um, another guard looking out of a, a burnt church building to protect me. I'll speed up through a few of these, but th this was particularly upsetting because um, there's a chapel there, Chapel of St. Mary's, fourth century. That makes it a good deal older than our Lindisfarne up in the northeast of England, uh, which is sort of a national treasure. This, this chapel, fourth century, was destroyed by the, the mob I told you about, the 3,000 extremists. Um, and they occupied it for three weeks and they dug up the floor of the chapel, as well as doing all the other damage that you can see in the picture, to find the bones of the guardian monks who'd been there in the past, hoping to find gold rings, which of course, you know, they didn't because Coptic monks don't wear gold rings, especially not those who might be, you know, guarding a chapel hundreds of years ago. 
This is on the way out of Delga, um, and um, the chap in the, in the white top there is my Muslim driver, Mohammed. It was very nice, actually, very you know, helpful, as was everyone. And here's an armored personnel carrier on the way out. Um, things will get more positive in this presentation quite soon. Don't bear with me. Don't 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 uh, don't despair. <laughs> but this is a necessary background. Um, just as I arrived in Egypt for that first trip, um, the the newspapers were full of the story of a shooting uh, at a wedding in the poor Cairo district of El Warak. Um, and the worst tragedy of this was the killing of a little girl called Mariam. Um, she was just eight. Uh, and other members of her family and Muslim guests as well. Here she is. Um, this still upsets me, frankly, a lot because uh, I have three daughters myself and uh, my youngest daughter was just 12 at the time so um, particularly sensitive to it. Uh, little Marion was killed by 13 bullets and uh, also three Muslim guests were, were, were wounded as well, one of whom died from his wounds. Um, yeah so that speaks for itself. Uh, yeah. It was absolutely shocking. And I was due to attend a Coptic wedding myself uh, just a few days later uh, in Alexandria uh, at a church that was on a terrorist hit list. Uh, but after discussion with the family, um, they, they were determined, I was, I was amazed that you know, they were determined to go ahead. They said, you know, as everyone said, we have to go on. We, we, we mustn't allow this to stop us. Uh, here are tanks along the Corniche, the seafront in Alexandria at the time. So say there was a curfew uh, and I filmed, I took this photograph, but I also filmed it um, at four o'clock in the morning, rumbling along. Uh, so as I say, the, the, the celebration went ahead. Um, I also visited the Western Desert in a at a monastery called uh, St. Samuel the Confessor. And the abbot there, Bishop Basilios, um, said, you know, why do people hate like this? Um, why kill an innocent child 13 times? We, we must carry on loving, you know, even if people shoot us, basically, is what he was saying. Um, and that later became uh, the sort of the title um, of, of a film that I cobbled together from uh, pictures and video that I'd taken during my journey, uh, which I made because no one else, no one else had had the privilege to see it. Um, since uh, that first visit, I've traveled uh, 20 kilometers uh, across open desert, basically, a desert track, uh, in the dark and in the daytime, but the first time was in the dark. Um, and it's a very dangerous journey because there have now been two massacres of pilgrims, as I've called them here, uh, on their way to St. Samuel's using that same desert track, which I know well. The first was in May 2017 and the second in November 2018, when I was actually in Egypt. And, and you know, I know the people there, I know the monastery, I know the track. Um, it's very upsetting and, and security is really not adequate. Yeah, so this is just a note that some um, Muslims who are of an extremist persuasion take certain verses in the Quran um, very literally and very aggressively uh, rather than other verses which say that um, those they would call dhimmis uh, such as Christians, uh, should be allowed to live as subordinates paying something called the jizya tax for state protection. I won't go into that now, it's not desperately relevant to our talk today, but, but you know, there are crazy people, unfortunately, probably in all faiths, um, but the ones to be worried about in Egypt are these Islamists. 
that we need to work for peaceful partnerships. So this is just talking about the film that I made. I made a one hour film, never made a film before, um, called No Need to Hate, uh, taking this title from Bishop Basilios. And I was invited to show this at Westminster to members of both the House of Commons and the House of Lords, um, because as I say, this, this was unique footage. And I made 70 copies on DVD, which I gave out to parliamentarians and many other people. Um, I then went back to Egypt and gave out copies of the DVD to various people, especially, of course, His Holiness Pope Tawatos, who'd made it all possible. And here I am giving him the DVD, um, sharing my report with him. And again, you know, very friendly, very welcoming, very, very, you know, he could not have done more. So I'm deeply grateful to Pope Tawadros. Uh, I even told him a few funny stories and um, we had a laugh together. So <laughs> he has a good sense of humor. And this time you can see my handshake is even warmer. Now on to the more positive stuff. So um, in 2016, because I had contacts now all over Egypt, I was invited to stay uh, in a mud brick village with a Coptic family um, in Upper Egypt. And Upper Egypt um, includes cities like Minya and Sohag, as I mentioned, and it's the area where there's the highest proportion of the minority Christians. Uh, so it's a good place to find out where interfaith tensions can be, can be addressed. Uh, and I was hosted by a family uh, who uh, sell herbs and stuff from a tiny little shop with every, everything in sacks. Um, it's very interesting to stay in, in, in a village. Um, actually, I've seen the village through a number of years now and it's changing, but back at that time, uh, five years ago, there were, there were a few means of, very few people had, had anything uh, to travel with. So you'd walk, uh, some people had motorbikes. Uh, I think there's one car. Here I am in the village behind me, one of the mud brick houses, not, not the one I stayed in, but uh, a, a mud brick village house. And here's my host, Romani. Um, meat's very, very expensive. It's actually more expensive in Egypt now than it is in, in England, uh, even though average incomes are much lower. So then in 2016 and indeed now, I think a lot of people have to rely upon uh, bread and uh, beans, which is a very ancient Egyptian diet. And herbs are used instead of you know, pharmaceutical products produced in factories because herbs are much cheaper. So again, a part of a, of, a, of a village street, this is what we call Tesco's. Uh, it isn't Tesco's, of course, but it gives you an idea of a village convenience store open, you know, till very, very, very late. Uh, mud brick house again, I've mentioned that before. Very crumbly. Uh, this is a better part of the village, but still you can see the drains aren't great, even though this particular uh, group of uh, housing has a, an air conditioning unit. And you need that in the summer because the temperatures go up to the high 40s Celsius. It's really, really hot. This is admittedly one of the worst houses I came across, uh, but you see, you know, it's extremely crumbly and the roof, um, in fact, the whole construction is pretty similar to what would have been used by the ancient Egyptians. Um, I mentioned this briefly, the, these, these metal uh, drainage covers for, for manholes get stolen and then people stumbling along uh, or walking along at night, fall down the fall down the hole, uh, and some people die. I mean, <laughs> you have to be careful. Uh, if the if the lighting's not great, you know, there's also scorpions and things. But open drain covers are dangerous. So I wrote a report about the village, and one of the people interested in it I, I knew would be uh, His Royal Highness Prince Charles. Uh, who's very interested in uh, 
community development and, and interfaith tensions and all sorts of things, which uh, what I've been able to see might be uh, able to um, inform. Uh, so I was invited to write a report for him and I sent it to Clarence House where he lives. And he very kindly wrote back to me and said, you know, thank you for the report. And that he was going to be giving, or that he already in fact had given, that it took a long time to get to Egypt. Um, he already had put in train the giving of quite substantial donations to some of the places I visited, which I will tell you about in a moment. So that's, that's a good result. Um, and this is my fourth meeting with His Holiness, because I met him twice in Cairo, as described. Uh, I also met him a third time briefly in Luxor in 2016. And this is my fourth meeting with him uh, when he came to England. And he remembered the previous meetings. So, you know, hats off to Pope Tarodros. He's a, he's a great man. Um, moving from the head of the Coptic Orthodox Church to the head of the Church of England, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, um, he's, he's the head of something like 85 million Christians, um, and he's based at Lambeth Palace in London. Um, and he has something called the Reconciliation Team, which tries to assist understanding and improve uh, relationships between faith groups throughout the world. So I, I started to visit Lambeth Palace and work with this team again to assist in whatever way I could with improving situations. Um, now, there are several um, monasteries um, within a few miles of the village that I stayed in. Um, and I mentioned monasteries, not because I'm a monk, obviously I'm not a monk, uh, but because they just seem to be centers of community improvement, a bit as they might, might have been in Britain in the Middle Ages for all the problems that monasteries had in the Middle Ages. You, you will know more than I, I'm sure, but, but um, you know, they also did some good. Uh, and the ones in Egypt still are doing some good, I believe, as I was able to see. Uh, and they benefit all the people in the local communities, um, Muslims as well as Christians. Um, and that assists, you know, general community uh, relations as well. So first I'd like to talk about an agricultural improvement project at the monastery of St. Pachomius, or in uh, Egyptian Amba Bachon, uh, which uh, is led by um, an abbot called Silvanus uh, and a leading priest, Ashaya, uh, on the northeastern outskirts of Luxor. And I met Father Ashaya and um, British trained veterinary staff um, who look after all sorts of animals, the, the uh, cattle and water buffalo, ducks and bees I've mentioned here, there's all sorts there. It, it, it's to improve the agricultural skills of the local community to, to grow uh, produce, uh, to generally raise, raise economic benefit locally. Um, and they also teach metalworking. Uh, here's a label from the uh, from the honey pots that, that, that they issue, um, the honey farm, as they call it, um, apiary uh, of, uh, of the monastery of, of St. Pachomius. It's, it's quite nice honey. Um, and and um, the good thing is the bees don't seem to be uh, affected by bee problems that we have here. This is me with um, with Dr. David Saveris, who's a, a vet, uh, and uh, Father Ashaya. It's a water buffalo. I think they're very significant, as I'll come on to mention. Um, we're not used to seeing them in England, but they're very significant. <laughs> and uh, he's a trainee uh, agricultural worker learning to work with cattle. Now, because of the partnership um, and uh, largely, I think, the money from uh, Prince Charles, um, they've been able to buy 15 more water buffalo and to improve that rather 
unpleasant looking compound for the herd there. That's not very nice, is it? So that's much better now. Um, and they've hired and trained more local people to look after these water buffalo. So why water buffalo, you say? Um, well, basically, buffalo milk is creamy and nutritious. And um, I can vouch for that myself. <laughs> uh, and it's especially beneficial for poor children. Um, so um, it, it, it's good all around, basically, more water buffalo. And the monastery uh, delivers the milk around to the local uh, area. And to save on fuel costs, uh, they've now been able to buy a big tank and bury it uh, from which they, they can draw fuel uh, having bought it in, in bulk, which is a bit cheaper. Um, here I am visiting uh, Father Ashaya and Abel Silvanus again in 2018. Uh, I tried to visit again in 2020, just before the pandemic, um, but uh, Abbot Silvanus was, was traveling away. So I didn't get to meet him. Um, and very sadly, he died in May of last year. So May of this year uh, from the uh, coronavirus um, situation. Yeah, that's sort of agricultural improvement, which is continuing. Um, there's also a project about primary education. Uh, there's a little primary school, which is one of the community improvement project run by uh, a much smaller monastery called uh, Monastery of the Saints, uh, dear El Gidesim, and that, that's been run by uh, Abuna Sarabamon. And they teach Arabic, Egyptian Arabic, uh, that is Coptic, religious studies, maths, good citizenship, and a little tiny bit of English uh, to help the children's employment prospect. These children are very poor. And it's not at all guaranteed that they would get any education, frankly, apart from what they get uh, from this little school. Some would, but many wouldn't. Um, they too, I mean, this has been in a way more of a focus uh, than, the, than, the, than the agricultural project. Um, but through money it's been possible to raise and general you know goodwill um they've doubled the number of children they now have there to 180 uh taught by um 20 local women i've said here actually there, there are a few men as well um and most of them don't receive any any money at all um a few get you know a pittance basically but but you know they're happy to, to try to help um, and the, the teaching environment has been refurbished and extended as well through, through, through this partnership. They've also been able to hire a third minibus, uh, which is great. Uh, and they've also opened, reopened the woodworking shop because they train people in um, all sorts of things, not just basic carpentry, but marquetry and cabinet making and all sorts of stuff, which is highly skilled. And there's a metal working shop as well. Um, and above that, there's a chicken farm, uh, which has been expanded from 2,000 hens to 5,000 hens. And four more young people have been given work. Um, they, have, they have quite high levels of education, but there aren't necessarily jobs available in the area. And this is very, you know, very good for, for local employment. So in 2018, I had the idea of joining up this little school in Egypt with a little school here in my home city of Plymouth, which is run by the Church of England. And that school was keen to, or had been keen to have me in to talk about children in Egypt, because part of the curriculum for primary children is to learn about children in other countries. So, you know, I've had this experience of, of meeting children uh, and, and other people too, of course, in, in Egypt. So I, I went in and gave talks about you know, food in Egypt and um, all sorts of things. And uh, we came up with the idea of um, making friends. I came up with the idea of making friends between the two schools so that children in both places could make friends with children of their own age in the other country, insofar as language constraints and all other difficulties uh, permitted. So what I did was I made a giant uh, sort of tabletop size 
A0 bilingual welcome poster, which you see here in English and Arabic, um, for the children in Britain to send to uh, the children in Egypt. And they, as individual children, made little A4 uh, posters about you know, their own interests. So two of the teachers held up the big poster in the, in the playground, as you see, you see the size of it. Um, and I, I took a copy of this picture with the, the children, the teachers, and the big poster. That picture took a copy of that to Egypt with the big, with the big poster and the little A4 mini posters. And uh, Mr. Hakim Zaki, who is the carpenter uh, at uh, Gidesin, put this in a nice frame and put it on the wall at Gidesin. And here's some of the little mini posters that came from Plymouth. And there, there were lots, there were like 20 or 30 or something. And all of them went on another board uh, in front of which Father Sarbamun is standing in the corridor of the newly refurbished teaching area. So this is like the grand unveiling. Uh, I was invited to, to stand in front of this and, and scribble a sort of thing at the top of the poster saying, you know, welcome again. And everyone was very happy. Uh, I was there for five days on that occasion and saw children arrive early on um, in the morning and they leave again at midday because it gets pretty hot and uh, travel in these mini buses. And on two of the days I went out with the children to see some of the places they live in. So here, just a few pictures of Egyptian villages again in the vicinity. Uh, some of them are pretty crumbly. Um, I uh, have lots more pictures, not, no, not all as crumbly as this, but everywhere, everyone was, you know, hugely friendly and hospitable, uh, as ever, dare I say, you know, lovely, lovely people. So we, I, I attempted to give some simple English lessons while I was there as well, on a couple of days. Um, did one, one of many pictures. Um, the children, uh, already learn two languages. Uh, they formally learn Egyptian Arabic and they formally learn Coptic uh, as the language for worship for them. Um, but in addition, you know, they try and learn a few bits of English. They're very young, they're only three years old to eight years old. So this is their third language. And I think that's remarkable. Um, I, I don't know that that, that would be attempted in, in British schools. Uh, for children so young to, to try and teach them three languages. Um, my Arabic is far from brilliant, um, so that constrained <clears throat> what we were able to do, but at least I was making an attempt. And I also brought some simple English books for children with pictures in and so forth, which I left uh, behind for the teachers to work with. And then the children sent back a giant poster from them uh, to the children in Plymouth with mini posters from them as well. So we sort of completed the, the partnership that way initially, set it up. Here's the, here's the illustrations of that, that poster. And all of that went on to the wall of the little school in Plymouth. Uh, both BBC Television and Radio Devon reported on this uh, because um, it's the first time apparently that an international and interdenominational primary school partnership uh, has been set up um, like this. And it spans, you know, as I've said here, thousands of miles, different languages, and very different circumstances for the children. But in both places, I think, in fact, I know because I've seen them talking about it, they're, they're all very excited and pleased that they've got these sort of, sort of friends in a distant and exotic country, you know, because. Britain is a distant exotic country if you live in Upper Egypt, and certainly Egypt is exotic and distant if you live in Plymouth. So they're very happy. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury's reconciliation team put up what I call a summary poster. Oh, sorry, that's when I was invited to talk about it with the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and this is the summary poster. Um, 
to it just sort of as <laughs> as you'd expect it summarizes the whole partnership but it's gone on since that that, that beginning in 2018. Um, also i should say the archbishop of canterbury is something called the ecclesiastical visitor to merton college it's a sort of church of england thing um and um i was a student uh at this college in oxford um and they decided to give some money to uh the local school and that has enabled a bit more to be paid to the teachers um and, and to buy some mats for the children to sit on and even better merton invited me to give a public talk a one-hour lecture in fact in Oxford in May of 2019, uh, which is fairly high profile because the previous speakers had been Professor Lord Peter Hennessy, who's an FBA, <coughs> very famous economist at the University of London, um, and Dr. Sange, who's, who's the president of the Tibetan government in exile. Um, and then, then they had me. <laughs> um, there were others as well in the series, but um, it, was, it was high profile. And then um, I was able to take back in January 2020, just before the pandemic kicked in, um, some replies uh, from Plymouth children back to uh, the Egyptian children who'd sent them um, replies to their initial mini posters. And this is Father Serbamon looking at the summary poster I mentioned. Uh, but again, tragically, uh, Father Serbamon succumbed to coronavirus also in May of this year. So we've lost two uh, very dedicated and kindly men uh, who were working for the community good. And of course, very, very many more have lost their lives in Egypt uh, through coronavirus. Um, now, finally, um, I wanted to show you something which uh, is maybe particularly dear to my heart, um, craft workshops for learning disabled young people. Uh, as I said here, all over Egypt, but especially in the poorer areas, uh, I've noticed that learning disabled folk seem to be given no useful or interesting occupation. Basically, if you're male, families and, and society generally, you know, is willing at least for you to beg, although cops tend not to try, not, to allow that, uh, but it happens sometimes. And if you're female in all communities, you're very much uh, kept at home for, for protection, um, which is very boring, of course, and very disheartening and very difficult for all concerned. And in Luxor, it's the city of, of, of the order of half a million people. Uh, there's very little, very, very little provision for learning disabled people, young or older. So in 2019, because um, I, I knew some people in Egypt in this situation, uh, I was thinking what on earth could be done, if anything, you know, could we help from, from this country? And um, I came up with an idea which I put to some Egyptian friends and they said, ah, Fikra Helwa, uh, lovely idea. Um, so we've now used that, that, that name, Fikra Helwa, as a sort of um, name for the project. And the idea I had was to, to set up little workshops um, for learning disabled people to make small and easy things uh, like, like bracelets. Um, so I have three daughters, as I mentioned before, and I know uh, that many girls at least like to make things like uh, elasticated bead bracelets. And boys can, you know, may, maybe make other things like candles or, uh, as I've said here, Egyptian. Uh, life symbols, the Ankh, uh, made from clay. Uh, and people and people not only enjoy the process of making these things, but it gives them respect. They know they've done something good, they've got something tangible, they can show to their families and other people and be proud. Everyone is proud of what's being done. It's better than simply sitting indoors twiddling your thumbs, you know, this is, this is positive. So I, I, what I did was I bought um, 500 um, initially biodegradable, allegedly, <laughs> plastic bags, um, bought thousands of colored beads and meters of elastic. And then I designed and, and 
had printed locally 700 little small bilingual sticky labels uh, saying Vikra Helva, um, lovely idea. And made up these signs to display uh, for um, places where, where the bracelets would subsequently be sold, we hope. So here's an example of a bag with a bracelet and a sticker. And a display of a variety of, of bracelets, different designs, you know, um, individual people make, make individual designs. Uh, so there's a whole variety. Uh, so in our current uh, group, we've got Christians from local churches, we've got Muslims, some Muslims as well from local mosques. And um, the watchword is everybody is happy, as I keep saying, everyone is welcome and everyone is happy, uh, as you'll see in a moment. And, and before the pandemic, we already had young people who are deaf, people who are dumb, uh, deaf and dumb, uh, Down syndrome people, and encephalics, that's people with uh, inadequate brain development, and those with other disabilities. This is one of our first sessions. Okay, so this is uh, a little girl called Mariam, I believe. Um, as you can see, she's wearing a hearing aid. She's quite severely deaf. Uh, she was one of the people uh, taking part in our first session. Here's a bit of film of her doing her, her, her particular bracelet. The, the, the people there could choose what, what beads they wanted to use and, and make their own design. And she's very happy, as I keep saying. Uh, these are two sisters. Uh, the girl in, in the black there is called Irene, and the one in the furry top is Marina. And they're both, uh, they both have uh, problems because uh, the, the brain development was not uh, as might have been hoped. Uh, so they are learning disabled, uh, but you'll see them taking part in our session here. Okay, and here's some more people and the, and the sign on the table that I mentioned before, which is used elsewhere too. Uh, this girl is dumb. <laughs> So uni again. Arena. Uh, this girl has downs. And this is sort of group group photo. Um, big smiles. And the families are very happy too. Uh, this, this was followed by a wonderful, I think, encouragement because uh, in Luxor, where this session was held, uh, there is an enormous temple, Karnak, uh, arguably one of the biggest um, temples in the world. Some people say it actually is uh, the biggest temple complex in the world. It's, it's from ancient Egyptian times, very, it's world famous. And there's a hotel near there, the Hilton Hotel. Uh, which normally gets many, many tourists. And they have agreed to display the Fikra Helva bracelets in one of the shops in their lobby, uh, which would be sold at, at you know, pretty low cost to tourists and others. Um, no, no profit to anybody, but a percentage of the, of the sales is returned to, uh, to encourage the young people to make them. But the Hilton is not taking any commission at all and none of the other people involved in this is taking any money at all. So if there is any payment made, it will only be to the young people making the bracelets. Uh, 
Uh, so, I, you know, not perhaps for me to say, but I think that's extremely encouraging and a great endorsement of the concept, uh, which indeed other people have liked the idea of too, and will hopefully be able to roll this out into other places in Egypt. Um, this is Mariam Tabet, who's in the shop at the Hilton, uh, just, uh, just to show uh, the shop where the, the, the bracelets are sold. Okay, uh, now I think we can all benefit from things like this uh, if we're willing to try and set them up, even if they're very small uh, sort of seed crystals. And the, 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 my sort of summary statement here is, you know, have a go, why not? Um, don't be stopped by lack of resources. Uh, I know if you work in universities and other groups, uh, there are all sorts of bureaucratic hindrances, but, but you know, where there's a will, there's a way, as we say. Um, and rather than just saying, what a mess, uh, it's better to just try and do something about it, even if it's small. As I said, lighting even a small candle is better than cursing the darkness. So have a go is my, is my message. Um, and that's it. So are there any questions? Thank you very much, <clears throat> David. That, that was a very interesting uh, well, very interesting presentation. Um, the conversation which um, needs to arise out of this is um, uh, number one: um, uh, how do you keep it going? <laughs> so, how, what, what is the um, what is the administrative um, structure that supports this? Because um, for people from the university background, we th this is part of the um, application process. It's meant to you're meant to demonstrate how something can be sustained in the, well, at least for the duration of your project, but what structures did you put into place or is it completely built on trust that the other side will continue with the project? Um, well, at the moment, it's, it's extremely basic. It's basically, it's just me uh, doing all the, all of the admin from this side of things. Um, I've begun to, to interest some uh, more formal structures. I mean, I, I mentioned the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, and his team. Uh, they're interested, but not actively doing anything, dare I say. That, that sounds too harsh, but uh, it's down to whatever I do. Um, my own university here in Plymouth is, again, interested, but they're not supporting it financially in any way. Um, and and um, so it depends on goodwill from uh, well wishes to occasionally, you know, give me some money and money I contribute myself. So that's the, the, the financial side. In Egypt, uh, there are many people interested. They, they tend not to be able to give money for it. Uh, they are doing the admin stuff side of it. So I have several people in Luxor who work on the Fikra Helwa project uh, free because uh, they see the benefit. And the, the monasteries, as I mentioned, have been directly involved as well, but sadly, two of the key figures there have died in the past year. So it's all a bit, you know, difficult. Um, a couple of months ago, uh, well, yes, a, a month or so ago, I was approached from some people in Cairo uh, who seemed to be interested in having me work with the Egyptian equivalent of the NHS. Uh, so I hope I can involve them in at least the Fikra Helwa project. Um, and there are some psychiatrists in, in, a, in an NHS group uh, working in Cornwall in, in, here in England uh, who are also interested. So slowly, uh, bit by bit, we are, we are building up interest and trying to form a network of, of those interested and capable of helping. Um, so one of my next aims is to try to make contact with other universities who might be interested in helping even if there's no finance associated with it, some people might be interested in doing it out of interest or goodwill. Uh, and, you know, over the course of time, the momentum, I hope, will build up through publicity um, and, and, and build further. Romina has a question, namely, whether you considered establishing a non-governmental organisation, either here or in Egypt. I mean, if you, Yes, so actually setting up an organization that can outlive 
because we're all mortal, you know, I can fall down the steps and so on. And then yes. the, the yes. two priests, they gave way to COVID. So this is um, uh, an organization usually tends to last longer, but uh, what, what are the obstacles? So what, what are the um, prospects for death? Well, well, I've been, a ch I, I still am a charity trustee for some other organizations. So generally speaking, to set up a, a charity, um, you know, if you're small, you don't need to make too complicated annual returns and things. If you are less small, then it all gets, gets very bureaucratic. But even for a small charity, you need, you know, a board of trustees. Um, it involves lawyers and meetings and stuff, um, which, which we haven't, we haven't done. Um, mainly because uh, it, it, it seemed to be taking up time from, from the actual work, if you see what I mean. So yes, I, I understand what you mean. I, I'm, I'm not immortal. I'm not a spring chicken either. Uh, so I don't know how long I should be able to continue with this. Um, if I don't find it possible, then maybe I, I hope there will be others who will, who will you know, catch the spark, as it were, and carry on with the idea. Uh, and I thank you all again today for taking part in this, as it's a means of, of just showing the sort of thing that might be done. You can all do your own things, you know, obviously similar to this or, or help with this, that'd be great, whatever. But um, we just haven't got around to it, frankly, Lars, um, because it was all a bit bureaucratic and, you know, legalistic and whatnot. But yeah, ideally it's a good idea, but it takes money to run these things. And as, th as things have been standing, all the money, whatever I've been given, has gone to the people in Egypt. I've not, you know, I've not kept anything for expenses or phone calls or whatever else. It's all gone to the work over there because they are the ones who need the money more than we do generally. Yes. Romina uh, has something to say now. G can you speak, Romina? Uh, yes. Can you hear me, Lars? Yes, I can. Well, thank you, David, for the presentation. That was really, really fascinating. Um, myself, I have, I guess, over a decade working in the African region, and I kind of relate to what you're saying that you you don't need, uh, you know, financial means or or a funded project externally to do what you believe in that that could help, right? And 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 be impact oriented. Uh, and not just constrained to a desk, right? Doing research, uh, it can it can be knowledge for social impact. Um, I, I guess what I was, I'm kind of in the same situation, but I'm fortunate now to have a grant uh, funded by UKRI, and I'm working in Ethiopia in Eastern Africa, uh, and we're trying to actually reverse the knowledge transfer from the UK to uh, you know to low and middle income countries, which has been the historical paradigm uh, and learn from our counterparts in Ethiopia and Eritrea uh, and, and feed that learning into the UK domestic violence sector. So we're looking at actually at promoting religious culturally sensitive domestic violence systems. Now, I'm fortunate that after 10 years of being a poor student and struggling like you to build those relationships and do that research, uh, I am a trained anthropologist myself, I have uh, obtained this grant. But, you know, even if you have the grant, just I want to put this out there, uh, it's not sustainable per se, right? What makes it sustainable, I think, is what you're doing, David. It, building those connections and trust and those two-way partnerships uh, that, you know, the true, the genuine respect that will, will feed people's uh, commitment and loyalty. I think loyalty is really important. Um, and, and what I suggested, the, the non-governmental organization, I think it's if you do consider it, perhaps, I don't know the laws in Egypt, but actually it's easier for us to, to establish it in Ethiopia, which is what we're looking at instead of the UK context, because the charity laws are so complex, even when you're a small entity, as you said. So perhaps looking into the Egyptian uh, legal system and seeing if that's that's a possibility and then having it uh, staffed by, you know, Egyptian uh, uh, colleagues and, 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 you know, people you trust who could then build it from the ground up and then they own it and they, you know, they feel that they're doing something uh, and also perhaps, you know, giving them a livelihood as well. So I think you're right. It needs that initial capital, but I think you've been so effective uh, reaching all these stakeholders and, and really disseminating the initiative. I, I think, I mean, I really, I am really impressed because I think you've done a lot in terms of reaching, you know, high level stakeholders um, that that even a funded grant over a one million funded grant would would not achieve. So I think you've been you've been quite strategic with with whom you've reached to. Um, so I think you know I think you could definitely consider that because it's such an important initiative to create more links between 
uh, you know, low and in, low and mid middle income countries in general, but non Western countries, you know, more broadly, and the UK and Western industrialized societies, because, uh, you know, not just in the spirit of helping each other, but in the spirit of decolonizing and in the spirit of understanding that we are we are so much more similar than different, and you know, and really crossing boundaries because nowadays uh, it's so internationalized, right? The world um, we have inter international migration, diaspora, people working internationally. So I think. Uh, I think this this initiative really deserves to continue. I just wanted to share that. And thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Romina. It's, it's very encouraging of you to say that. I'm, I'm very, very grateful to you. Um, please, please, you know, if, if there's anything uh, you feel we, we too could get uh, by working together in some form of synergy, I'd be very grateful for that. I uh, don't mean to take away from your existing work. I'm sure you're a very busy lady, <laughs> but um, you know it, it is also possible that that maybe um, we we could work together in some way. Uh, I, I had a nice meeting with Lars up in London uh, a, a few weeks back when one of my daughters was getting married, uh, and I do hope I can carry on working with uh, with friends at SOAS as well, which is you know a, a world famous institution and, and and deeply respected. So. Any any of these links that might be possible, I would very, be very grateful for, and um, you know that would be great. And I will def definitely you. share my contact. Yes. <laughs> if you are both around uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, January for the um, for the Coptic uh, New Year, maybe we can have a, uh, a, a get together. I mean, in person at SOAS, uh, where we can have a joint uh, uh, as you know awareness raising and perhaps even fundraising meeting um but this is something that we will need to see i mean yes but, but that that was an idea that i had in the beginning but i'm so afraid that um you know uh, the authorities here will close down everything because of the oh. new this variant. yes <laughs> okay can, can, can i yes. can i sorry to interrupt can i just briefly say i'm hoping God willing, and, and COVID willing, perhaps is the right phrase nowadays, um, that I will be able to go back to Egypt from the 27th of December to the 10th of January. Uh, yes, yes. The Omicron variant may, may, may make that difficult, but that's what I'm currently booked to do. And right. I want to make contact with Egyptian universities somehow, if I possibly can. So if SOAS, if SOAS, if, if, if folk at SOAS could help me with that, again, I'd be very, very grateful. Uh, it's so difficult to find people of goodwill in yes. in universities anywhere, let alone universities abroad. Escandaria, the Alexandria, that, that's the university connection that SOAS has. But I see a hand here by Nicholas. Nick, come, please come in. Um, David, yes, I, I've listened in absolute amazement to uh, to what you've done. Um, and it, uh, it, 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 it completely um, overshadows anything that I tried to do myself earlier when I um, set up what I called Eastern Christian Links. Um, this was inspired initially from the idea of raising some money for um, a charity that I was connected with in, um, in Eastern Europe. Um, and I uh, started to give talks um, on orthodoxy to churches that would be willing to uh, make a contribution to this charity in exchange for giving the talk. Um, I exhausted all the churches um, within, uh, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 miles of where I lived at the time. And um, the intention was to try to raise awareness amongst churches in the UK about churches in the Middle East. I learned a huge amount by doing that. Um, and I, I, I hope that one of the two of the seeds may have um, fallen on the on, on good ground, as it were. Um, I developed that by then taking pilgrimages. Um, when I took to the churches in uh, um, Turkey, uh, I had the benefit of um, uh, Metropolitan Seraphim, the um, um, Metropolitan Bishop in charge of the British Orthodox Church. Um, we then went to Syria, and what you have experienced from the authorities in Egypt under terrible conditions. Um, we experienced exactly the same under much more benign conditions in 2006. Um, 
who were assisted by an agency of the um, Syrian government, which existed to promote, um, if not reconciliation, certainly cooperation uh, among the Christians and, sorry, among, among the religions represented in, um, in Syria. And we were privileged to meet, have introductions to, and, and, and have discussions with um, senior Islamic um, clergy, uh, sheikhs from both the Sunni and the Shia um, populations. Um, the message that we got from both sides and from ordinary members of the, um, the community, again from both sides that we met, was we Christians, we Muslims, we can live together. There is no problem. Um, and and um, I vividly remember the Orthodox priest who was given to uh, look after us whilst we were in Aleppo uh, from the Greek Orthodox um, uh, Archbishop, um, placing his um, very tall black hat on the uh, front of the minibus that he was using to drive round um, mm -hmm. in a perfect display that he was saying, this is a Christian monk <laughs> or priest on, on, on his travels. And local people were delighted to see him. Um, unfortunately, of course, tragedy has overtaken Syria. The people that we know, that we met, um, well, two are captured, kidnapped, um, fate unknown, one is murdered. Um, what will happen, I don't know, but um, it, it, the, um, what, what you have done has, is, 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 is utterly amazing um, and, and uh, hugely to your credit. Um, I just wish that our activities could have been remotely similar. But the idea that you have got, um, humble as I am, all I say is uh, absolutely wonderful. And I can only wish you the very best of them, um, of good fortune in it. It's something that we absolutely have to do. These are our brothers. Uh, and, and there is no reason for Islam and Christianity not living together in some peaceful way. Okay, Nicholas, thank you so much. Uh, deeply grateful. I'm, I'm, I'm blushing rather at the comments being made by our select few here. Um, <laughs> um, it's very kind of you. A again, please, you know, let's stay in contact if we can through Lars. Um, I think we could share all sorts of, of information about trying to talk to people in Britain about this, because I've given talks to, to many, many churches and schools and things as well. It's usually fairly disappointing. A little interested uh, British Christians are in Christians in the Middle East, even though Christianity began in the Middle East. They just don't seem to bother about that. Um, so again, if we can work together, I'd, I'd be grateful and uh, very keen to hear whatever guidance you know any or all of our people gathered today can can help me with. If you can, please. Thank you very much. Again. My experience is simply that plugging away, and, and I, oh, I do very little now, I'm afraid, because I've sort of retired, but um, it, oh. it, 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 is, it is so essential that um, the message is, is put wherever, wherever one can. Plug, plugging away is, is one of the main elements of success, I think. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> but as I say, I, I, it's, it's been humbling to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please put up on the um, the text that will accompany this uh, uh, recorded session on uh, the SOAS YouTube channel, uh, your contact address for anyone inviting anyone to get in touch with you who uh, wants to contribute, uh, because I think this is something that will be, I mean, it can be watched uh, in perpetuity <laughs> around the world. So if anybody types into a search engine, uh, um, you know, head Fikra Helba, then, then you will find you will get through to that. But um, in any so, case, I, I so, so it's nice. Forgive me interrupting. Thank you, thank you for that. If you're talking to me about putting my contact details on, yes, I don't yes. know how to do that. Can I can I send you my con? I mean, you have them, but I mean, could you do that for me, please, or advise me on how to go about doing it? I will put that in Just in any case, uh, I will have to finish now, but. Um, Thank you very much. And um, uh, to all of you uh, uh, watching this uh, afterwards, uh, and to those of you who joined us here, um, I would like to say, say goodbye from the British Library today um, in central London. Um, I, it was a remarkable presentation. And I, uh, I think the thoughts that uh, you gave us on our daily uh, 
walks through uh, life are, are, are tremendously uh, it's like how, how can we help how can we contribute because we all have uh, our own ta talents if we have um, talents in the greek sense if we have a lot of money then of course that we can also contribute that but, but the sense of our own uh, uh, interests and um, uh, education uh, th that is something that we can also look at okay but I i'm going to stop this now i'm going to say goodbye to everybody and uh, i am uh, Looking forward to seeing you, Lumina, in a different context. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thank you, Lars. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you again. All the best. Thank you.